Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and it's a great privilege to be uh, here uh, with uh, Constantine, Dara and their teams in the wonderful Bloomberg Centre. Uh, and of course, it's a particular pleasure to be here as part of my St. Patrick's Day programme here in London and in the United Kingdom. Uh, before I say a few words about that programme and go on to address some of the themes that Constantine referred to in, in his introduction, uh, I do want to, on behalf of the Irish government and people, recognise the terrible events that have taken place and are unfolding in New Zealand. Uh, they are an open, such a friendly country, and uh, for any of you who have friends and family there or have reason to think about what is unfolding there, we all extend our thoughts and prayers to you at what is a very difficult moment uh, for that great country. Uh, as I said, uh, I am here as part of my St. Patrick's Day programme, which is, as you, as you will all well know, our National Day of Celebration. And every year at this time, government ministers travel to our most important partners to strengthen Ireland's global network of relations. The size of the celebrations that are taking place across Britain reflect just how many generations of Irish people have come to the United Kingdom to work, to study, and in so many cases to live. And I am a very good example of that. I lived in this great city for five years. I lived in the northeast of England, in Newcastle. I've worked in many different parts of this city, uh, from Barking to Dagenham, to Ilford, to Haringey, many other parts of the city. I plied my trade as a salesman on behalf of a consumer goods company. I have family that live in Peterborough, that live in Leicestershire, that are from Leeds. And my life story and the time that I spent here, the professional development uh, and the wonderful experiences and great effect that it had on me as a young Irish citizen, are so typical of now the hundreds of thousands of bonds and ties uh, between Ireland and the United Kingdom. So here this morning, I'd like to speak to you a little bit about those connections, about the relationship and friendship between Ireland and Britain, and the partnership between our countries. I obviously will make reference to and address the changing relationship between Britain and the rest of the European Union, including Ireland. And I want to offer some observations regarding the appropriate response from politics within Europe to the kind of change that we're seeing unfolding at the moment. Because I think Constantine is very wise to make the point that we do need to continually look beyond the agenda of today, no matter how consuming and difficult it is, to reflect on what are the challenges and opportunities of tomorrow. And of course, there couldn't be a better place here this morning to address that topic than to be here with you in Bloomberg in this centre. Because of course, this is a place where the notion of exchange is central, where the exchange of ideas, the flow of information, provides the underpinning and the foundation for the exchange in markets that in turn drives our global economy. So it's for that reason in particular that I'm looking forward to your questions and doing my best to answer them in a few moments' time. So if we look at where we are today, it does sometimes feel over the last two years when it comes to relations between Ireland and Britain that we haven't been able to speak about anything else but Brexit. And I'm sure for some in this room here today, I'm sure it feels like you don't often get the chance to talk about much else. Decisions that were discussed, that were debated, and votes that have taken place this week are shaping and will shape 
the future director, direction of relations between the United Kingdom and the European Union. I will say, obviously, a few words in a moment about those changes. But what I want to do first is I want to address the very modern relationship between Ireland and Britain. And this is a relationship that is defined and heavily influenced by interdependency. Last year, the combined value of bilateral trade between Ireland and the United Kingdom was worth 72 billion euro. Britain is Ireland's third largest single market, accounting for 15% of our exports of goods and services. But in turn, we, Ireland, are the United Kingdom's fifth largest export destination. So this means that British trade with Ireland nearly outstrips the combined trade of the United Kingdom with Brazil, Russia, India and China. Our businesses support 200,000 jobs in each of our countries and we have 60,000 Irish citizens that are company directors in the United Kingdom. So this is a two-way economic relationship that really matters for both countries. But as our great poet Seamus Heaney once reminded us, a country is obviously not just an economy. And our two-way relationship extends far beyond economics and trade. We share so many things. We share a common history. We share so much with respect to language and culture. So with so much going on, it, it's hardly surprising, but you might be interested to know, that the Dublin-London Air Corridor is the busiest in Europe. And the same corridor is the second busiest in the world. And over the space of recent generations, the relationship between our two countries has been transformed. A relationship that did struggle to escape the confines of a contested past has arrived at a position of parity, of trust and of friendship where we are co-guarantors of peace on our islands. And while there were many steps in this transformational journey, there are two in particular that stand out. The first was our shared decision to join the then EEC in 1973. It changed my country. It set the stage for an unprecedented development of our economic prospect, prospects and for our political and for our social freedoms. It was a transformative moment. It firmly established our confidence as a nation on the world stage. I stand in front of you here as an Irish and a European citizen and politician, and both dimensions of that identity coexist with each other. They don't compete with each other. And of course then, this changed our relationship with the United Kingdom. We found ourselves as colleagues, from government ministers at council meetings, to politicians in the European Parliament, to officials discussing technical points at EU working groups. We developed a shared grammar and vocabulary within the parameters of the European Union. And this in turn contributed to a second fundamental change in our relationship, which was the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. The cornerstone of our shared commitment to peace and stability on the island, it was agreed between the two governments and the political parties in Belfast. And in turn, that built on 
the developments within the European Union and of course was the start of a new chapter in the relationship between both countries which was transformed again for the better. We now of course face a further shift in the relations between our two nations. Brexit simply is an absolutely immense political and economic challenge. We deeply regret that the United Kingdom is choosing a different path after 46 years of shared membership. But of course, we respect their right to do that, particularly as a country that has a rich tradition of referenda. However, our future remains as a committed member of the European family that we have played our role in shaping and helping to grow. Indeed, our membership of the European Union is our greatest protection from the challenges that we know Brexit will bring. So whatever the outcome of the Brexit process, Ireland will remain an absolutely committed member of the European Union with the solidarity, the stability and the certainty that that membership brings. We are of course disappointed that the British government has to date been unable to secure parliamentary approval of the withdrawal agreement. However, the subsequent confirmation by the House of Commons that it does not support leaving the EU without an agreement is, of course, deeply welcome and very significant. However, simply agreeing that a no deal should be avoided is not enough. In order to avoid a no deal outcome, MPs must set out in concrete terms how they propose to avoid it. We remain firmly of the view that the best way to ensure an orderly agreement and protect both the Good Friday Agreement and the integrity of our single market, because it's not just a European single market, it's an Irish single market, is to ratify the withdrawal agreement. So it's worth therefore recalling what the backstop is and why it's needed. This is simply, but fundamentally, about protecting the peace process, about respecting, understanding, and indeed also protecting the daily lives of communities who live on both sides of the border. If we are to avoid physical infrastructure there, there needs to be alignment of regulations on both sides of that border. And we, in turn, need to be certain that this alignment will not diverge over time. That's what the backstop is. That's what it seeks to achieve. It's an insurance policy. It would only be used if we are unable to agree a sufficiently ambitious future relationship between the EU and the UK that would remove a need for us. If it is to be triggered, it would be temporary until a better solution is found. We have no desire to trap the United Kingdom indefinitely in any backstop. The European Union has now provided strong assurances and guarantees in response to concerns that were raised by the United Kingdom in this regard. And while we have heard repeated contributions about the role that technological solutions and alternative arrangements could possibly play, there are currently no such solutions that have been proposed or indeed in operation that would solve the issues that are needed at this border at that point. It's fair, therefore, to say that this two-year negotiation has not been easy. There have been compromises 
on both sides. And the political uncertainty in Westminster is obviously a cause of worry for our people and our businesses. And that is why ratification of the agreement will and would allow us to move towards building a strong future relationship with the UK after its departure. However, given this continuing uncertainty, we have no chance, no choice, but to ramp up, to accelerate our no deal planning and to move into the advanced implementation of these plans so we can do everything possible to limit the inevitable and great disruption to consumers and trade that a no-deal scenario would pose. My focus as Minister for Finance is to protect our economic and financial interests and to minimise in those circumstances the disruption to the Irish economy to the greatest extent possible. We have now passed through our Parliament a Brexit omnibus bill and this bill was passed with the very constructive and very responsible support of the opposition parties in our Parliament. It's an unprecedented legislative measure. It focuses on protecting our citizens and supporting our economy, enterprise and jobs, particularly in key economic and vulnerable sectors. However, Brexit, in whatever form it could come, is a historic challenge for Ireland. And the implications for our economy will be disproportionate relative to others in the U European Union. But that's why it's important to state that we are facing those challenges in a robust economic position. With the highest national income growth in the European Union and record employment levels. Our export and job creation indicators are very positive. We expect, if not blown off track by Brexit, national income growth of this year of 4.2%. We have reduced our unemployment levels to 5.6% and we are on track to reduce our national income and debt ratio to 60%. For the first time in a decade, we operated a budget surplus last year, and I intend to do so again this year. We will, of course, have the capacity to operate a deficit if we need to, to allow the automatic stabilizers within our economy to work well. We have set aside one and a half billion euro in a rainy day fund, and over the next decade, we will invest 116 billion euro, which is more than a third of our national income, in long-term critical infrastructure, while keeping current expenditure in line with national income growth. But let me be clear, we do not wish for a no-deal outcome, nor do I underestimate for a moment the great challenges it would mean and pose for our economy and our society. And that is why we're doing all in our power to prepare. But ultimately, our membership of the European Union and our commitment to openness are our greatest protections from the challenges that Brexit will bring. We rely on the support and the solidarity of our friends and partners in the European Union, which we have received. Our companies will continue to benefit from the opportunities of the single market and the EU's global network of free trade agreements. And as one of the world's most open economies, a key part of our success is our commitment to trade. I believe that open markets and a rules-based global trade system is an essential component to ensuring global economic growth. And international companies with global ambitions 
will always need access to the single market. So from an Irish perspective, we will continue to attract investment with a pro-business environment underpinned by a tax code which is not only competitive, but more importantly, is simple and tr is transparent in how it functions. We have Europe's youngest population and one of its best educated, encouraged to think and to create. And our doors remain open, not just to investment, but to people, to ideas. In the space of less gen a generation, we've become a diverse and an even more inclusive society. Today, more than one in six of us living in Ireland was born elsewhere. Our workforce is the third most international in Europe. So while we are, of course, an island people from a small island, we are and are proud to be the very opposite of insular. And far from being on the periphery of Europe, we always aim to be and challenge ourselves to be at its core. One of the founding members of the Euro with an economy and a people that demonstrated resilience at times of great difficulty. But let me also say to you that the openness that characterises the Irish economy today to Europe and to the wider world, to the opportunities of global trade and investment, to the exchange of capital, of goods and services, and to and of people and ideas. These are the very ideals on which the European Union was built, and we believe this openness will stand to us tomorrow. So that is why we believe our economy can still grow, even if the scale of that growth would be lesser than in an agreed Brexit and if a no-deal scenario was to unfold. But at a time when we are clearly seeing attitudes to globalisation, to free trade and multilateralism hardening elsewhere, Ireland remains firmly committed to the political and economic value of openness. A common thread that is clearly appearing across many democracies, one of insecurity, of uncertainty, of apprehension about the future, whether this is caused by economic decline, perceived or real, whether it is about debates about immigration or a general perception among citizens about a lack of agency or ability to influence the shape of their society. For many, the pace of social mobility has slowed. This is combined with a heightened awareness of great wealth. And these are challenges that all societies and all democracies are grappling with. I've recently been reading the wonderful novel Middle England by your great British novelist, Jonathan Coe. And I was struck by how he captured this sense of the different realities in which many of us live now, cheek by jowl, as he but us, but also in different universes. And these universes were separated by a wall, infinitely high, impermeable, a wall built out of fear and suspicion, and even shame and embarrassment. They were his words. And of course, these walls can be about many things, about different experiences of life, different levels of access to education and employment, different levels of equality and opportunity, or for too many, no opportunity at all. So we cannot ignore this. We cannot pretend this doesn't matter. If this is left unaddressed, this will corrode our sense of community and the fundamental values on which our societies and our democracies are built. The public, citizens, expect modern governments to provide consistent progress and gradual improvements in living standards. And then questions are inevitably asked when the outcome is different. It becomes easier to understand why some of our citizens feel 
that decisions are taken in other places that are shaping their lives in ways they don't understand or feel they can't control. And as we are seeing right around the world, there is a pushback against the political centre. So we need to challenge this narrative. The nations that have been best managed and mitigated these social, economic and political dislocations are ones that have actually taken control by investing wisely in developing economic opportunity for their citizens. They understand the paradox that in an era of enormous change, the role of the state as both a guarantor of social and economic security and a provider of opportunity has become ever more important for those nations like my own that are most exposed to globalisation. And I say this as a politician who argues and supports the political centre, but who believes that the centre is not static. But it must be an ongoing process of adaptation and renewal that incorporates ideas from different parts of our political spectrum. The political centre cannot be the status quo. So in renewing the centre, we must seek to reform both the state and the market in the interests of the common good. And a large part of this work involves making markets function better to be aware of and in the public interest. So rather than looking to minimise government intervention in the market at times, we should focus on the role of regulation, focus on the role of intervention where needed, but also optimise the manner in which markets are crafted to help them better recognise and contribute to the public interest. Equally, we must have the intellectual honesty to recognise where markets don't work and a clear and robust understanding of their limits. And as politicians of the centre like myself, we must continually make the case why the political and economic model available to us offers the best means to deliver the greatest security, opportunity and even well-being for us as individuals and as societies, but also recognise the need for change. We need to make the case as to why interdependence is not a weakness, but a strength. I participated this week for two days in Brussels in the monthly Eurogroup and ECOFIN meetings as a peer of other finance ministers. That's not a weakening of sovereignty. I'm sharing sovereignty to strengthen us. And I'm clear in my mind that the European Union represents a vision of cooperation among states for the common betterment of our citizens and our societies. It's the best framework within which we can renew our political centre. That's what I am committed to advancing. And it is a vision which I believe is all the more important in these uncertain times when we hear voices challenging the political centre in Europe and all that it stands for. So ladies and gentlemen, in politics, as in life, I am an optimist. But to subvert a Marxist thinker, we need optimism of the will and optimism of the intellect. The political centre will continue to offer the best opportunity for security, for prospect, for well-being for our citizens. We can make this case. We can bring our citizens with us. We can make the changes that will ensure that the liberal international model is capable of better providing common goods. And we need to realise this ambition in the changed relationship between the United Kingdom, Ireland and the European Union. And we will, through the European Union, listen to our better angels, resist division and build a new but different centre for our European, for our Irish citizens in an ever-changing world. Thank you.
just like to say thanks to the minister for a very interesting speech. Um, quoting everyone from Jonathan Coe to Mark. It's not a range we hear very often. Um, I did notice that you avoided one very divisive topic in the speech. Uh, in this room, there may be many Arsenal fans in this room. I believe you're a Spurs fan. Is that true? Yes. Why, why, why looking to unite all of you here today, I do so in the spirit of supporting the greatest football club in the world, uh, which, of course, is uh, 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 near here. And while continuing to break my heart in a number of competitions, I have every hope for outstanding success in the big one. Uh, okay. Sounds like it might be Brexit, uh, a description <laughs> of the bre current Brexit process. Um, so uh, we've got about 25 minutes for questions. I'm going to open with one question, and then I'm going to throw it to the floor. Um, so, Minister, you, you mentioned you're an optimist. Um, how optimistic are you at the moment that Theresa May will be able to get her uh, Brexit deal through, either a meaningful vote three, which you may see early next week, or subsequently? What's your current assessment of where things are at? So I, I'm, I'm very conscious as we move into this part of the morning and the questions that are going to come to me that I'm actually a participant in this process at the moment, which is taking place, which is still unfolding. And therefore, I have to be uh, quite deliberate in terms of what I say. Uh, because of the influence I could yet bring to bear on what might happen and the role of the Irish government within us. So what I will say in what happened to this week is clearly the votes of uh, Wednesday night in particular are exceptionally significant. But in order for uh, that to have the effect uh, that some would want, it is really imperative now that clarity is brought to bear on how the ambition of leaving without a no deal taking place, how it is spelled out, how that is actually going to happen. I think that's a really crucial development that will take place. And uh, of course, I'm hopeful uh, that we will get to a point of agreement. Uh, but the coming days that are approaching are clearly going to be every bit uh, as uh, dynamic and I'm sure challenging as the days that we have just gone through. Uh, I met the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Philip Hammond, yesterday, a uh, very close colleague of mine, a politician who has done an enormous amount to look to advance the economic interests of his country in the context of Brexit. And uh, I know and I believe that they will be working very hard now to look to bring this to an ordered conclusion. Uh, but clearly, the few days that are now approaching continue to be of the highest importance. If we do end up talking about an extension, is you, would your preference be for a relatively short extension of around three months? Or I saw Simon Coveney talk about yesterday about the possibility of a 21-month extension to give the UK time to reflect. Would your own preference be for a shorter or longer extension? And do you see the EU imposing conditions? I mean, we hear a lot of this idea that the UK you know, needs to justify why it might need an extension. And the, you know, the so idea there could be some conditions attached. I mean, what's your own view in terms of the length of extension and potential conditions? So I think as we are accelerating, accelerating the, de the debate about the possibility of an extension and the duration of it, I think we need to take a step back and look at what I believe are the strategic priorities at the moment. And I believe there are two. The first one, as many European Union leaders have articulated, is what would that extension period be for? And clearly, given all that we have now gone through, in watching the British political system grapple with the complexities of Brexit. There are many in the European Union who would want to be very clear on how this extension period will be used. The second point will be is that I believe it is uh, highly important that we do all we can to avoid being in a scenario of rolling cliff edges, where there is a sense now that we have just came through one, but the next one that is approaching is the real one. So they are, particularly from a financial market stability perspective and an economic stability, I think we need to be aware of that. What we have said is obviously the British government need to decide if they do want an extension, how long they will want it for. And we will be positive and constructive in relation to that when they put it forward. Um, and the exact phrase that Taoiseach used there last night is that Ireland would provide a generous response to this. And that's our view, Dara. And you say you're keen to avoid uh, rolling extensions. So I, I take from that your preference is for a longer rather than shorter extension period. So how do you get over this key question about European Parliament, Parliament elections in May? How do we deal with that issue? 
I think it is clearly a, uh, a very significant challenge in relation to that. Uh, and uh, um, I know that's a key consideration for the British government at the moment. And they're contemplating what that would mean. Uh, because the treaties have some very clear statements in relation to us. Uh, and uh, look, I think that will be a factor in what the British government decides to look for if they do go for an extension period. Okay, so they may look for a shorter one that then gets extended again. Look, again, I think there's going to be some decisions made in relation to this across the next few days. I'm going to let the House of Commons and British government make up their mind on those matters. And Ireland has been very clear in relation to the tone that we would operate and conduct ourselves in if we get into that place. But I think we do need to be aware of objectives that we will all share in that period. Okay, so I'm going to throw um, it open to the floor now. Um, we've got three um, people with mics. Um, and if I can just ask you uh, to state your name and the organisation before we ask the question. And please, no speeches, just questions, if that's okay. Um, so, I'm sorry, I, I, <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> it never works for me. Um, so uh, I'm going to go with the lady in the front row, uh, in the second row here, if that's okay first. Um, sorry, can we bring the mic up here? Thank you. Oh, oh sorry, I was going to, this lady here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think actually, so why don't we just go with this question, then we'll come to you if that's okay. So go for it. I'll stand up, it'll be easier. <laughs> Thank Catherine Cavanagh, I work for FTSE Russell at the London Stock Exchange. I've got a, just one question. It relates to our very precious and guarded 12.5% corporate tax rate. It has been a feature of so much of the fund's inwards investment into Ireland. I know that the UK has always been our ally when it comes to facing off against the Franco-German alliance. I'm wondering, as we move into this new era, how does the government feel about protecting our 12.5%? We remain confident that that will be uh, protected and secured in the uh, approaching development of the European Union. The reason why I believe that to be the case is while your analysis is correct that it was of course uh, two countries in particular that were willing to make the case for an element of national competitiveness being the role of taxation, that's a view that is shared by many, many, many countries and many countries see uh, the, uh, their role to determine their own tax rate and base as being critical to decisions that they make themselves as national parliaments. So um, you will see a growing number of countries, for their own reasons, uh, make that case publicly. Um, and if you combine that with the decision-making processes in relation to how tax policy is set and changed within the European Union, I'm confident that Ireland can continue to be certain about that part of our proposition. But I would say it's only part of our proposition. Ireland does not get the recognition that we do deserve for all of the changes that we have made in our corporate tax code. Uh, we have got rid of stateless companies from our tax code. We have fully incorporated all of the requirements that we have of the OECD BEPS process. We have brought in advanced mechanisms to deal with the disclosure of information between competent authorities and to deal with aggressive tax planning. Uh, and we have continued to make the kind of changes that we know are now needed of the consensus in relation to what best practice is in global tax policy. Uh, so we will continue on that journey while also saying that it is part of what can make a country competitive, but for us, not all. Okay, sorry, this lady here. Uh, thank you very much. I hope this microphone's on. Um, I'm Colette Bow. I'm the chairman of the UK Banking Standards Board. Um, I was recently able to help yes. uh, our colleagues in thank Ireland. And thank you for that. You know, yeah, I do course. indeed. I'm intrigued to see what, what, do, what do they have. So uh, Colette has been leading fantastic work here in the UK that she may refer to in a moment regarding development of banking standards within your larger banks and looking at the relationship between that and individual accountability. And as we looked at that work in Ireland now, we're now doing both. Uh, we're now putting in place such an approach from a standards point of view. And Colette was good enough to come over and share her experiences in Ireland regarding the learnings that you have here. Very pleased to do, Minister. Uh, like many people in the room, possibly, I'm <coughs> I am an Irish citizen. Um, so, 
However, I don't want to talk to you about banks. I wanted to ask you from the standpoint of the needs of Irish business now going forward, what are your priorities within your budget strategy as between, say, infrastructure, <coughs> uh, education, and health? You're implying you have a fair bit of headroom, and I'd be very <coughs> interested to know how you're seeing the major needs to support the Irish economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so the sense of headroom that I may have generated there is driven by the fact that I talked about a 10-year plan. Uh, and it is my uh, uh, very firm commitment that if we can work our way through the challenges that we have at the moment, that Ireland would move into a second year of surplus. And in the coming weeks, uh, I'll be publishing the stability programme update uh, to my colleagues in the European Commission, outlining our view of the performance of the Irish economy for this year and the different economic metrics that are crucial. Uh, what I did outline in my uh, short speech there is Ireland 2040, which is a 10-year capital plan. And if I was to look at what are the particular areas of capital investment that matter for us, at this point in time, I'd have to signal housing, uh, where we find ourselves facing a very pressing need to release and build large amounts of homes again uh, because of the rebound in our domestic economy and the heightened interest that companies now have in Ireland. And then I'd have to signal what we're doing in education, where in particular capital investment in our higher education bodies, our universities and our uh, colleges is a real priority of mine. And I'm very pleased that if you were able to go to any of our major universities and colleges in our country at the moment, you'd see really significant physical development on the way. And I really want to continue that because I believe they are at the heart of a kind of more intangible competitiveness that small countries like my own are going to need. Okay, I'll put, sorry, it's gentleman here. Yeah. Um, hi there, I'm uh, Andy Bruce from Reuters. Um, I'd just like to, to ask you, Minister, if uh, in your mind, do you think there's anything more that Ireland or uh, the European Union can do to help get the UK over the line in terms of a Brexit deal. Thank you. We have done all we can do and are going to do. And uh, the agreement that uh, the European Union, uh, through the leadership of Michel Barnier, uh, have uh, made with the British government, including the work that happened across the weekend and into Monday night, will now not be changing. As uh, President Juncker said, this is now the agreement and the decision that uh, the House of Commons will make and are in the process of making is whether, if they are going to leave, that that is the agreement upon which they will be leaving on. Uh, but that is the agreement and uh, it will be not changed any further. As a Spurs fan, you're used to last minute wobbles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and do you sense, I mean, there's always been this fear that you would get to the last summit before Brexit. And in the words of, you know, Bertie Hearn, Leo Bradke will be taken aside by Angela Merkel and uh, Macron and told, look, I'm sorry, uh, we have to get this deal across the line, so you must accept a, a five-year time limit on the backstop. Um, you have no fear at that last minute the EU solidarity will wobble. The, the European solidarity that has been shown to Ireland up to this point will continue. The European Union is a political construct. It is a political construct that has very profound economic articulations, but it's a political construct based around a set of values. We're staying. We're part of the European Union. The United Kingdom are on a different journey and uh, the solidarity and understanding of that uh, is firmly in place, as has been evidenced by what President Juncker said on Monday, as was evidenced by what President Tusk has said, as has been as evidenced by what President Macron has said over the last number of days and weeks. One interesting theory I've heard a couple of times is that the EU doesn't need to, um, doesn't need to exert pressure on Ireland because at some point internal pressure in Ireland will grow. And we saw that this week when the no deal tariffs were produced, farmers instantly came out saying 
this is horrendous, there's no way we can, we can live with this. Um, so a Fianna Gael government couldn't kind of come to that point. What do you say to those internal groups who worry that Ireland has pushed the backstop question too far, pushed the UK towards a no-deal Brexit, and people are going to lose their jobs? And, in fact, if you go with no deal, you're probably going to have to do a border north-south anyway, as well as east-west. So what do, you, what do you say to that argument? Uh, that the backstop is as much an indispensable tool of our uh, economic future as it is of our political stability. Uh, that any change regarding the status of the border on our island would not only have profound political consequences, but would have profound economic consequences as well which is why we have worked so hard on the development of that concept and text now for two years in relation to particular groups and parts of my country that would be particularly affected in a no-deal scenario. Uh, uh, as I have said in the Doyle back home, and you would have heard me say publicly in Ireland, I absolutely understand the anxiety and concern that they will face. Our, our no-deal planning is now at a very advanced stage from a port, an airport point of view, what we will need to do. And in the event of a no-deal scenario taking place, and it will have particularly acute consequences for parts of our economy and our society, in addition to the supports that we have put in place for them up to this point, I and the Irish government will act more. Back to so, um, this gentleman, second row here. Please. Good morning, it's Thomas Ralph from Metrobank. Uh, Ara, um, I will, as I'm here living in the UK, and one of the reasons is because I used to work at one of the failed banks in Dublin um, during the financial crisis and had to move here for economic reasons. I'd be delighted to move back. What my question is, you mentioned in one of the previous answers um, around housing um, growth, around relaunching the growth in housing um, and the growth in the banking industry in Ireland is well known. Those who, are, uh, repeat, those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. What actions are the government taking to make sure that we don't go into another cycle of boom and bust, another cycle of property lending led uh, growth um, and transaction taxes based spending that we can't sustain? Okay. Well, can I first say you'd be very welcome home. Uh, and uh, it'd be great for you to join uh, the many Irish and European uh, citizens that are coming to live in Ireland. Uh, so uh, I hope that can happen at some point. Uh, of course, you quoted there the prospect of repeating the past. You'll also be familiar with the approach that many finance ministers and governors of central banks have said, in which they assure people that this time it will be different. And I'm acutely aware of that. So what are we doing to deal with the kind of dangers that you've highlighted there? Number one, the Central Bank of Ireland have very, very firm and clear macro prudential lending rules in relation to the operation of our mortgage market uh, that have my absolute support. And the independence and role of the Central Bank in Ireland and the work they have done is absolutely understood and protected by this and uh, all future Irish governments. So a key point of difference versus where we were in our past is the willingness to stand by how we manage the availability of credit in our economy, which at this point in time is now a fraction of where we were at the peak level, which is appropriate. Uh, what I've also done is I have shown my willingness to use certain areas of tax policy to look to better manage our tax base. So I tripled stamp duty in relation to commercial property to look to use that as a tool for moving economic capital within our economy and also to deal with a risk that you've highlighted. And then in my last budget, and this was a very difficult decision, I increased a, our VAT rate, which is our tax on uh, goods in our hospitality and catering uh, sector. I increased that from 9% back up to its full rate. That was a measure to take and to get our economy going. As our economy is recovered, I withdrew that tax support. And uh, they are the kind of measures that I will take and are taking to deal with the kind of vista that you've outlined. What we are looking to do now to try to move forward on the supply of housing 
is as opposed to using tax policy to do it, we've made interventions in our planning law, our planning processes, and interventions in the funding of infrastructure to look to move forward the supply of homes. What I have not done, nor will I do, is use tax policy as a way of achieving that. Okay, I have a couple more questions. I'd like to get another couple of Brexit questions in, because I think it is. So this, so this gentleman um, here, yeah, mid-round. Uh, so I say, first of all, thanks, Minister, for having us here today. It's a very unique event. Um, I'm going to go straight in the in the deep end here. Um, one of these uh, kind of potential upshots of, of Brexit is um, a border poll in Ireland and potentially, ultimately, a united Ireland. It's obviously a very complex issue. I'm sure if you did a straw poll in the room here today, you know, there would be probably split 50-50 as to whether people would think it's something they would want to see happen or not. Um, my question to you is, what's the government's position on this issue, um, first of all? Secondly, as finance minister, what, in your view, are the economic Im implications for the North, for the Republic, and, and I guess for you know the UK as well? And uh, thirdly, you know, as an Irish man, and I'm assuming a nationalist, might I be so bold to ask you what are your own uh, views on whether you'd like to see this happen or not? That's a great question. <laughs> three great questions. So, uh, out of your three questions, I'm just going to decide which one of them I'm going to answer now. <laughs> uh, uh, again, mindful of all that is unfolding at the moment. The view of the Irish government is very clear that a border poll uh, at this point would be profoundly destabilising and divisive for where our society and economy stands at the moment. Uh, that the ambitions of a united Ireland can only be realised in the context of the Good Friday Agreement and have to be based on the principles of consent for the, uh, all of the communities in Northern Ireland. Uh, and that principle of consent uh, has to be at the heart of how this issue is managed. And to uh, the nationalist communities in Northern Ireland, I hope they can see the willingness of the Irish government to make the case through our membership of the European Union for avoiding the prospect of the redevelopment of a hard border on our island. For the unionist community and our friends in unionism, and I had the opportunity to talk to some of them during my visit here, I want to continue to assure them uh, of our uh, respect uh, of, uh, of all that their uh, tradition and identity encompasses, an understanding of where they are at the moment, and to say that this is a matter that could only be moved forward on the principle of consent and the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, well, I also just recognise that, that would be, while it would have profound economic consequences, clearly the matters of politics, of respect, of tolerance and understanding the multiple identities on my island uh, would pre be preeminent for me as an Irish citizen and as somebody who's privileged to be in the Irish government. The great John Hume once talked about the concept of an agreed island. Um, and that is clearly a concept that becomes ever more important with the challenges that we are managing today. And your own personal view? Again, uh, with the decisions that are being made at the moment, my personal view is the one I've just outlined to you there. Okay. Um, and something you, you hear a lot, and apparently even Theresa May talks about this, is that if we did have a hard border, that would ac accelerate the possibility of a border poll and a possible vote for unity. What's your own view? Do you, do you give that any credence that a hard border would accelerate the process? I think if we were to see the development of, uh, of either the hard border or the prospect of a hard border on the island, it would have the profoundest of consequences for Northern Ireland, and those consequences could be quite immediate. Uh, but as, as I said, look, given where we are in this process at the moment, uh, I think it's appropriate that I leave it at that. Okay, I think we've got time for maybe one more question. So apologies when I get to your question. Um, sorry, I'm just seeing this gentleman you're in, here. You're in trouble, Dara, because the longer this goes on, the more hands are going up, <laughs> and we have to be out of here. Um, and they're only going to blame you, not me. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, take, I can, I'll take the hit, I'll take the hit. Sorry, this gent gentleman here. Hello, I'm Jerry Lees, I'm Chairman of Linear Investments, uh, MIFID FCA regulated entity. Um, I've got a specific question, it's about Brexit, but it's quite specific. Um, with, there's been talk of uh, the Bank of Ireland speed tracking uh, or fast tracking applicants for licences in Ireland have already licensed in the, under the FCA. Um, is that something that, that could, be, uh, could be happening? Because uh, there, there are a lot of people looking at moving potentially. 
Well, the, the central bank are not, um, uh, uh, so what they are not looking to do is in a sense, um, well, no, let me say what they are looking to do as opposed to what they're not looking to do. What they are looking to do is to be able to handle uh, efficiently and be able to implement all the regulatory duties on applications that are coming into them. It's fair to say there has been a very high level of application come in, very high. Uh, and I've been working with the central bank in order to making sure they have what they need in order to uh, meet their regulatory needs and also respond back to the level of interest in Ireland. Uh, and uh, I know they are now, uh, they continue to work hard to do that and meet those goals. We have had a, a very high level of interest in Ireland and in Dublin uh, as, a, 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 as an even bigger centre, not only for the location of investment, but also for the location of jobs. Uh, and that has been a, a, a very significant development within our economy. Uh, but the central bank are continuing to work very hard in that area. And obviously, and I know this is an area that uh, some of you are very interested in, as am I, I'm particularly pleased now that the current governor of the Central Bank of Ireland, Philip Lane, is now going to be uh, moving into the role of the chief economist of the European Central Bank. And uh, it's something I'm very proud of to see a governor of an Irish central bank, given the journey that we have made, now be in a position of attaining such high office within the ECB. Uh, there's been some criticism in Dublin, by contrast, that actually Central Bank has been too difficult to deal with, that they're too slow and they've been pushing away some of the more complex um, derivative stuff. How do you respond to that? Well, see, look, this is the, 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 this is the joy of political life, uh, because, of course, you hear multiple views on the same issue. Uh, uh, but I know the Central Bank uh, have done an uh, exemplary job in looking to manage this issue. Clearly, from an Irish point of view, we need to be absolutely confident that the regulatory requirements that we have are being discharged fully. They've done that, and uh, we've also worked with the central bank to make sure they have what they need to respond back to a very high level of interest in Ireland. Uh, and uh, they've got that balance right there. Okay, I'll take the privilege of the last question. Um, so it was a very interesting piece in Sunday Times uh, last Sunday, Minister, by uh, your neighbour, Shane Coleman, who suggested that uh, you're not only the nicest man in politics, but also the most likely to be the next, next Taoiseach after Leo Varadkar. Is that a role that you would be interested in if the vacancy came up? <laughs> well, it, it, it is a, a, that is a, a short and simple question that actually does have a short and simple answer, Dara, which is we have a Taoiseach, and uh, uh, I have a job, and the only focus I have is in continuing to do this job. And when we, get to, we got to this point before, I said I don't have an interest in being a uh, Fine leader. Uh, I'm very proud of my job and what I try to do and the office I hold, and it would be a great hope of mine to try to continue to do this job, even particularly if the environment that we're in gets more volatile and full of more change. I'd like to do, that's what I want to do. And uh, I'm very privileged to serve a transformational leader for our country in Leo. So you don't have an interest in being a Fine Gael leader now? Uh, 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 so, nor in the future. Okay. We nor in the future. Uh, this is my job. Uh, I'm very privileged to hold two offices within my country. The only focus I have is doing both of those as well as I can. And uh, I've no interest beyond that. Uh, I want to play a role in whenever it happens in uh, 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 seeing my party continue to do well in the future, allowing the Taoiseach to continue to serve in his office uh, because I believe he's only getting going. I believe he's capable of achieving great things for our country, both at home and on a European and global setting. Uh, and uh, I've no interest beyond trying to do uh, discharge and do my current offices as well as I can. And beyond that, I've no further ambition. Okay. So um, I just can I just say a word about you, Dara, and about Bloomberg? No, we told we thought uh, we wouldn't so do this. This is we thought. But you've asked me a question about my ambitions. So how are things going for you, Dara? 
Well, you know, I was talking about this the other day. As long as Brexit keeps going, I reckon my career will be saved till I'm about 50. Oh, okay? yeah. So oh, it's good. I, I, another well, couple of years to go. So. Well, Dara, I do want to recognise, particularly in front of the audience and everybody's here, the exemplary role that Bloomberg perform in helping us uh, understand and analyse a fast-moving and changing world. Uh, and uh, you do an exemplary job in Ireland in helping the rest of the world understand through Bloomberg what, what's going on in our country. So you can see so. this man is such a fantastic politician. He is genuinely the nicest man in, in, in politics, and that proves it again. So I'd like to thank the Minister uh, for coming in today. We really appreciate it. Um, my apologies if I didn't get to your question. We only had a limited amount of time. Um, but hopefully you'll be back again. If you'll have me. And we'd love to have you again. And hopefully we'll, you know, we'll see you again. So, okay, yeah, thank, you thank you all very much. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you.